Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. It's like he was just putting the pieces together for me in such a way that just was simple but powerful. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is God's truth right here. It wasn't always what I, what I wanted to hear, but I knew it was the truth, and I always wanted the truth. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach through this series entitled More Grace, More Favor. This is the title of a brand new book I've got out tomorrow is going to be my last day to offer this, the, not only the book, but also the CDs and the DVDs over our television program. They will still be available if you go to our website or call into our ministry. But over television, tomorrow is going to be our last day to advertise this. And we're asking for a donation of any amount for any one of these. But if you do give a donation and get one of these things, then we will add to it uh, this self-centeredness, the source of all grief, if you request it. And I tell you, this is powerful. These teachings have revolutionized my life. And you know, in a sense, it's hard to teach on humility because nobody is perfectly humble. And, um, and so I'm certainly not claiming that I've got this all figured out at all. But I can say I haven't arrived, but I've left this is something that God really worked in my life. Back 52 years ago, I had an encounter where God just knocked the wind out of my pride and started me on a, on a path to start glorifying Him and putting Him and His wishes above my own wishes. And So anyway, this is what we've been talking about, and we've covered a lot of material. There's no way I can go back through everything. That's the reason I'm encouraging you to please get these materials. Let me use John the Baptist as an example. Here in John chapter 3, it says in verse 26, it says, And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Now these are the scribes and the Pharisees who were in opposition to John the Baptist and, of course, became Jesus' greatest opponents. And when they came to John and said, He that you bore witness to, talking about Jesus, is baptizing and all men come to him, what they were doing was trying to play on his ego, on his self-centeredness. And they were basically saying, He's drawing more people than you are. They were trying to make John jealous, hoping that they could get John to make some kind of a statement against Jesus. I tell you, this is the devil's tactic. He always plays to your ego. This is how he came to Adam and Eve. They were living in perfection. There was nothing wrong in their whole existence. They couldn't point back to a dysfunctional childhood. They couldn't point to what was happening in society. They couldn't look at anybody else. They lived in absolute perfection. And yet, did you know how he got them to sin? He said, God's holding out on you. You could be more. You could have more. You could be like God. The truth was they were already like God. They were created in His image. And by eating of the forbidden fruit, they became further away from what God intended them to be, not more towards it. But He played on their ego. God is holding something back from you. It was all selfish. You know, if they would have just made a decision, it doesn't matter about us. God is God Almighty. He's God. I'm not. It's not up for me to sit there and evaluate things. See, if they hadn't have been selfish, if they hadn't had this propensity for selfishness, this, this temptation, this ability to be selfish, Satan couldn't have got them into sin. So this is exactly how he came to John the Baptist, playing on his ego, trying to get him jealous of Jesus. And look at John's answer in verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. In other words, instead of being jealous of Jesus, he said God is the one who's blessing him. God is the one who's prospering him. Would to God that ministers could have this attitude. I tell you, I have seen so many people that, you know, if somebody else comes up and ministers and people like them, then, then a minister will sit there and say, well, yes, he's good, but be careful. And they will always put something in there to discredit this other person a little bit. And I believe it's self 
motivation that does this because they're afraid that people might like them more than they like me. You know, I had a man at one of my minister's conferences one time, and he was talking along these very lines, and he says, the way I look at it is if I bring somebody in and the people love his ministry more than they love my ministry, he says, I'm the one that brought them in. I get part of that credit for it, and he wasn't jealous of other people. And, you know, I can truthfully say that in our Karis Bible College, I think this is one of the strengths that we have, that all of the instructors who are here, maybe, you know, a guest minister might come through and it'd be something different, but all of the people who are on staff and are part of this, uh, we honestly are out to promote Jesus, to bless the people. And if somebody likes one of the other instructors more than they like us, we don't get jealous of that. We rejoice in it, knowing that no one person is the total fulfillment of Jesus. You know, I, I am very confident in what God has called me to do. I know who I am. I'm staying in my lane. I am not intimidated and threatened by other people. But I'm aware that I am, I am not the full manifestation of God. I need these other people. Karis is so much better with all of us pooling our giftings and talents together than any one of us would be by ourselves. And this is one of the strengths is that there isn't this competitiveness and things like this. Where there's unity, there the Lord commands the blessing, even life forevermore, Psalms 133, verse 3. So anyway, John the Baptist says that it's God who's blessing him. John was not jealous or envious of him. And then in verse 28, ye yourselves... Bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. John the Baptist actually was having joy seeing Jesus prosper even at his own expense. Two of Jesus' disciples, Andrew and Peter, they actually followed. They left him and they went to follow Jesus. And it's according to this statement right here, uh, many of the people that had been following John the Baptist started following Jesus. So J John was decreasing and Jesus was increasing. And he said, my joy is fulfilled. Man, that's awesome. You know, just look at it this way. If you were pastoring a church, and all of a sudden, everybody was coming to your church and everything was going good. But then somebody new comes into town and they start a church. And all of a sudden, some of the people that have been your, attending your church go to another church. I can guarantee you, because I've been around so many ministers, the vast majority of ministers would grieve over that and think, what do I have to do to get these people back? And most of the time, the minister would resort to trying to somehow or another find something wrong with that other minister or that other church and discredit them. Maybe not in a way that made it real overt what they were doing, but somehow or another they would voice some kind of a criticism that hopefully would cause people to focus on the negative and not go over there but stay with them. That's the way that most ministers respond. You know, I'm going to say this because I am a minister and I think that as a minister, I have the right to necessarily criticize us in a way that maybe somebody who's not doesn't. But ministers are some of the most insecure people that there are around. I've even seen surveys that they ask ministers, how do you evaluate success? And the number one way that people evaluate success is either by the numbers of people coming to the ministry or by the money that's coming in. Very seldom do they evaluate success as doing what God called you to do. You know, there's a friend of mine, Lawson Purdue, who pastors Karis Christian Center in Colorado Springs, and, and he got the name Karis before I did. This uh, Karis Bible College started out being called Colorado Bible College, but when Lawson came to Colorado Springs, he started Karis Christian Center. So he had the name Karis and was using it before I was. But anyway, uh, I've known Lawson since he was 14 years old. And I went to his church when he pastored in Kit Carson, Colorado. And I forget the exact number of people, but it's somewhere around 300 people, maybe 350 or something in Kit Carson. And I mean, there's nothing around there. It's a long ways from anywhere. And when he was pastoring in Kit Carson, he had a church that was paid for. It was a nice church that they built. They supported missions all over the world, gave thousands and thousands of dollars. 
AND THEY HAD ABOUT A HUNDRED PEOPLE OR SO IN THEIR CHURCH. AND MOST PEOPLE WOULD LOOK AT THAT AND SAY, WELL, THAT'S NOT VERY SUCCESSFUL. HE JUST PASTORS A LITTLE CHURCH. BUT AGAIN, LOOK AT IT IN PERCENTAGES. IF THEY HAD 300 PEOPLE IN THE uh, TOWN OF KIT CARSON, AND HE HAD 100 IN CHURCH, DID YOU KNOW THAT'S 30% OR 33% OF THE PEOPLE? THAT IS AWESOME. IF YOU WERE TO TAKE THAT SAME THING AND APPLY IT TOWARDS A TOWN THAT HAS A MILLION PEOPLE IN IT, THEN THAT WOULD BE LIKE HAVING 330,000 PEOPLE IN THE CHURCH. PROPORTIONAL TO THE, uh, YOU KNOW, THE uh, POOL THAT THEY WERE FISHING IN, MAN, THEY HAD A GREAT RESPONSE. I WOULD CONSIDER HIM VERY SUCCESSFUL WHEN HE WAS IN KIT CARSON, AND YET MOST PEOPLE DID LOOK AT HIM AS JUST THE PASTOR OF A LITTLE TINY CHURCH. THEY ALSO GAVE A HIGHER PERCENTAGE OF THEIR INCOME TO MISSIONS THAN A LOT OF CHURCHES THAT ARE MEGA CHURCHES DO. I MEAN, THEY GAVE MORE, NOT ONLY PERCENTAGE, BUT MORE MONEY. THEY GAVE A LOT OF MONEY TO MISSIONS AND STUFF. AND SO ANYWAY, GOD SEES THINGS DIFFERENTLY THAN PEOPLE DO. I THINK THAT GOD SAW LAWSON AS SUPER SUCCESSFUL WHEN HE WAS IN KIT CARSON. NOW HE'S MOVED TO COLORADO SPRINGS AND THEY'RE RUNNING. I'M NOT EVEN SURE, BUT IT'S WELL OVER 1,200. COULD BE CLOSER TO 2,000 PEOPLE. AND THEY ARE GROWING, AND I BELIEVE THAT HE'S GOING TO BECOME ONE OF THE MOST SIGNIFICANT CHURCHES IN THE COLORADO SPRINGS AREA. BUT MY POINT IS, SEE, THAT WHEN YOU ASK SOMEBODY WHAT IS SUCCESSFUL, THEY LOOK TO NUMBERS, THEY LOOK TO uh, MONEY THAT COMES IN, BUT GOD SEES IT DIFFERENT. HE SEES IT BASED ON YOUR ASSIGNMENT. WHEN GOD SENT LAWSON TO KIT CARSON, COLORADO, AND THERE WAS JUST A FEW PEOPLE, I BELIEVE THAT LAWSON WAS VERY SUCCESSFUL BECAUSE HE WAS DOING WHAT GOD CALLED HIM TO DO. AND YET IT WOULDN'T QUALIFY AS SUCCESS IN THE EYES OF MOST PEOPLE. THIS IS WHAT uh, JOHN IS SAYING RIGHT HERE. HE SENT SOME OF HIS DISCIPLES AFTER JESUS. HE SAW PEOPLE PROSPER, AND YET HE HAD JOY. HIS JOY WAS FULFILLED. AND THEN HE SAID THIS IN VERSE 30, HE MUST INCREASE, BUT I MUST DECREASE. WHAT AN ABSOLUTE GODLY ATTITUDE. THAT'S AMAZING. MOST PEOPLE HONESTLY THEY WOULDN'T EVEN SAY IT THIS WAY. IF THEY SAID IT THIS WAY, THEY'D RECOGNIZE THE ERROR OF IT AND THEY WOULDN'T DO IT. BUT MOST PEOPLE HONESTLY EVALUATE EVERYTHING BASED ON HOW THIS IS GOING TO AFFECT ME. IF IT PROMOTES ME, IF IT GIVES ME MORE FAME, IF IT GIVES ME MORE INFLUENCE, IF IT GIVES ME MORE MONEY, THEN THAT'S GOD. BUT YOU KNOW WHAT? HERE'S JOHN THE BAPTIST, AND HE SAID HE MUST INCREASE AND I MUST DECREASE. YOU KNOW, IF YOU HAVE TO DECREASE IN ORDER TO SEE THE KINGDOM OF GOD PROMOTED, THE HUMBLE THING TO DO WOULD BE TO PUT GOD'S KINGDOM AHEAD OF YOUR OWN KINGDOM. AND AGAIN, I GO BACK TO SO MANY CHURCHES THAT THEY SEE SOMEBODY COME IN AND THEY ACTUALLY WAR AGAINST THESE OTHER MINISTERS BECAUSE THEY WANT THEIR CHURCH TO PROSPER. THEY DON'T WANT THEIR PEOPLE GOING OVER THERE. I HAD ONE MINISTER PUT IT TO ME THIS WAY WHEN HE SAW OTHER CHURCHES SPRINGING UP AND HE WAS TEMPTED WITH, YOU KNOW, FEELING uh, THREATENED BY THEM. HE SAID THAT THE LORD SPOKE TO HIM AND HE SAYS, DO YOU WANT TO BE RESPONSIBLE FOR THE LIVES OF EVERY SINGLE PERSON IN THIS TOWN, THAT YOU'RE ACCOUNTABLE FOR WHETHER OR NOT THEY HEARD THE GOSPEL AND WHETHER YOU REACHED THEM? AND HE SAID, NO. AND HE SAID, WELL, THEN DON'T REGRET OR DON'T BEGRUDGE ANOTHER CHURCH THAT COMES IN BECAUSE THEY SHARE THIS RESPONSIBILITY OF REACHING OUT TO ALL OF THE PEOPLE. SO THIS IS A REAL GODLY WAY TO LOOK AT IT IS INSTEAD OF THAT I AM THE ONLY CHURCH IN THIS AREA. MAN, WE NEED TO EMBRACE OTHER PEOPLE AND THANK GOD THAT HE'S SENDING OTHER PEOPLE TO HELP REACH OUT. YOU CAN'T REACH EVERYBODY. YOUR PERSONALITY ISN'T GOING TO REACH EVERYONE. SEE, AGAIN, THIS IS A HUMBLE ATTITUDE. AND YET SO FEW MINISTERS HAVE THAT BECAUSE, AGAIN, MINISTERS ARE VERY INSECURE PEOPLE. MINISTERS, IF THEY AREN'T CAREFUL, THEY WILL GET TO READING THEIR OWN PRESS RELEASES. THEY'LL GET TO LOOKING AT THEIR OWN STATS. AND IF THEY SEE A DIP IN THE INCOME, IF THEY SEE A DIP IN ATTENDANCE OR SOMETHING, THEY START DOING WHATEVER THEY'VE GOT TO DO TO GET THOSE FIGURES BACK UP. AND IT DOESN'T MATTER IF GOD HAS LED THEM TO DO SOMETHING DIFFERENTLY OR NOT. I KNOW A LOT OF MINISTERS, AND AGAIN, THIS IS MY uh, EVALUATION. THIS IS ANDEOLOGY. YOU CAN TAKE IT OR LEAVE IT. BUT I THINK THAT THERE'S A LOT OF MINISTERS WHO SHOULD BE OUT ON THE FIELD TRAVELING AND MINISTERING, DOING SOME KIND OF MISSIONS WORK OR SOMETHING ELSE, AND YET THEY PASTOR A CHURCH BECAUSE OF THE SECURITY THAT IT GIVES THEM. IT GIVES THEM A GUARANTEED INCOME. IT GIVES THEM A PLACE TO PREACH EVERY WEEK AND THINGS LIKE THAT. AND I THINK THAT WE'VE GOT A LOT OF EVANGELISTS THAT ARE ACTUALLY PASTORING 
and they should be out there evangelizing. And we probably have some people that should be pastoring who are out evangelizing. But it seems like people are always doing what's just best for them. And there's a lot of people that are ministering in a way that guarantees them success, but it may not be building the kingdom of God. And this doesn't have to apply only to ministers. This just goes to everything. You know, you need to be able to sit down and honestly evaluate, God, am I doing what you want me to do? Maybe God would want you to throw in with somebody else. You know, there was a pastor right here in Colorado Springs and I went and spoke at his church a number of times and he only had like a 100 people. And I don't know all the reasons why, but his church just stayed small. And there was another minister that came in town and he started a church and all of a sudden that thing just began to grow and balloon. And I mean, within just a matter of months, they had three, four hundred people. They eventually wound up with thousands of people in that church. And to the credit of this minister, he went over and started supporting the mega church. He offered to help. Is there anything I can do? And the mega church actually hired this guy to become one of the pastors on staff and they merged their churches together to build the kingdom of God. There's not very many people that would do that. And again, that's humility, putting the kingdom of God ahead of your own wishes. What is really best for the kingdom of God? You know, I, I've said this many times and I actually believe it. I know a lot of people doubt the sincerity of it, but if I felt that my time doing what God has called me to do was up and if he wanted me to go to a remote part of Africa and live in a grass hut and minister, I'd do it. it I mean, I've, I'm not going to do it on a whim because it's, it's amazing what God has done here and I don't want to just allow the devil to come in and destroy it. But if I knew for sure that God had somebody else that could take this Bible college and this ministry and reach more people than I could, I guarantee you I'd turn it over to him in a second. I really believe that. And this is, this is what you've got to do. When you humble yourself like that, when you put the kingdom of God ahead of your own kingdom, I tell you what, it works out to your benefit. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I think the NIV is the one that says a uh, hope in a future. When you submit yourself to God, God's plans for you are good. God's not into hurting you. God wants you to prosper. It says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants you to prosper, not only financially, but emotionally, in relationships, in every area, and He wants you to be in health. God is not the way that He's represented sometimes, that if you yield yourself to God and give your life over to God, that He's going to just make you do something that you hate. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Psalms chapter 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean He'll just give you anything you want because you might want something that's bad for you. You might want a new mate, and God's not in to helping you commit adultery. So this isn't saying that you delight yourself in the Lord and He'll just give you anything you want. This is saying when you delight yourself in the Lord, He puts His desires in your heart. He changes your desires. Some of you watching this program, before you got born again, you desired a lot of bad things. You might have desired multiple sexual partners. You might have desired dope and alcohol and just all kinds of things that you now know are wrong and you've been delivered from and you couldn't even see yourself going back and doing some of those things as you used to do. God changed the desires of your heart. This is what that's talking about. So when you yield yourself to God and when you make yourself a living sacrifice, you don't have to worry about God doing something that's going to hurt you and cause you grief and pain. That's not the way that God is. He desires good for you. His thoughts towards you are peace and not evil. And He has to send somebody to live in a grass hut in Africa to reach out to these 
people that aren't reached by other people. But if, if that's what he has for you, he will put it in your heart and you will love it. You will absolutely love what God has called you to do. Amen. So I'm just encouraging you with everything I've got that this way of humility and putting God's will ahead of your will is the best way to live. It simplifies life. It makes it so simple. You know, I've had so many people come up to me and say, God told me to do this, but... And then they tell me the reasons why it's not easy. It's going to cost them money. It's going to cost them friends. They don't know how they... And they, they just go on and they give me all of these things. And then they come back and so, so what should I do? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you to do this. When you just die to yourself and you no longer sit there and just say, God, I'm going to give you this part of my life, but this other part's held out. When you've got everything put on the table, God, it's all yours. Take anything that you want. It just simplifies life. It makes it so easy that if God tells you to do something, you just do it. Now, you may have to get clarification of how do I do it? When do I do it? Are you going to send somebody to help me do it? There may be some more wisdom, but it is not a question of if you will do it. You just have run up the white flag. You do what God tells you to do, and, and that's it. You know, going back, I mentioned earlier in the week when I had this encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968, and the very first thing, uh, major thing that God spoke to me after that, He told me to quit college and uh, to, because that wasn't His will for me. And man, I, this was during a time that people were sent to Vietnam if you didn't have a college deferment. I was getting money from the government. I was accepted by my family and church members and everybody. But when I said that God told me to quit school, the church kicked me out, said you couldn't be a Christian and say that God told you to quit school. I lost money from the government. I had family and friends reject me, and I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. Some people would think, well, that was all bad. Did you know, looking back at it, I think that was probably one of the greatest things that the Lord ever led me to do. Because when I went to Vietnam, I was a Baptist. I had no intention of not being a Baptist. I didn't even think about it. But I got to study in the Word up to 10, 15 hours a day and pray it. And when I got back from Vietnam, I went back to my Baptist church and they didn't want me. They said, you aren't a Baptist anymore. I had gotten into the Word and I was embracing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, miracles, and on and on, and all the gifts of the Spirit. And they didn't want me anymore. And it turned out, I'm not sure that I would have ever changed if I hadn't have gone to Vietnam, been separated from all of my friends and the, and the upbringing, the religious training that I had had, and just been saturated in the Word. It totally transformed my life. And I looked back, and it was good. It may not have looked good at the time, but it turned out. And I'm telling you that if you will humble yourself and just submit yourself to whatever God has to say, it'll work out to your advantage. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life, a God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do, and I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. If you sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. Every one of you are created for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose is? Many of you know that we have built a 1,022 space parking garage to accommodate all of our people that come to our facilities in Woodland Park. And it was at a $23 million cost. And we are trying to get that paid off as quickly as we can. Well, I felt like the Lord spoke to me about encouraging 23,000 people to give a $1,000 offering, either a one-time gift or pledged out over a period of 10 months, $100 per month. If you would like to be a part of that, I encourage you to call or write, go to our website and join our 1K Club. 
Do you want to connect with like-minded believers? Then Karis Bible Studies is the place for you. Find a Bible study near you by visiting karisbiblestudies.net. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study five days a week. Andrew's teaching, More Grace, More Favor, is available as a brand new book or as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Or you can get the More Grace, More Favor package, which includes the book and your choice of either the CD or DVD album. This package has a catalog value of $50, but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for just $35. Also today, Andrew has a bonus offer. You can request the Self-Centeredness, the Source of All Grief booklet for free when you order either the book CD or DVD album from Andrew's new teaching, More Grace, More Favor. The free booklet is limited to one free per household and is only available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these teachings. Or you can call our helpline 24 hours a day, five days a week, Monday through Friday at 719 719- 635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of September, join Andrew in Woodbridge, Virginia at the Voice of the Apostles event. In October, Andrew will be speaking in Colorado Springs. Next, come join Andrew in Woodland Park for our annual Minister's Conference. Then he'll be speaking in Budapest, Hungary for a Grace and Faith Conference. Also in October, Andrew will be hosting the Andrew Womack Ministries European Minister's Conference in Walsall, England. Guest speakers at this event are Paul Milligan, Billy Epperhart, and Bob Yandian. Lastly, in October, Andrew will be hosting a Grace and Faith Conference in Wienendal, Netherlands. And in November, come to Woodland Park for the annual Women Arise Conference. Speakers at this event include Tracy Asia, Karen Conrad, Sue Nutman, and Audrey Mack. Please note, Andrew will not be speaking at this event. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net.